You're listening to Amy Keeps It Creepy, the podcast where I share my obsession with creepy stories of true crime and the paranormal with you. I'm your host, Amy Brooks. Murdered maids, dolls that move in the night, a sinister spirit who hates cats. This is the Monte Cristo Homestead. Check out our website, creepypodcast.com, or on Instagram at creepypodcast for all the latest Amy Keeps It Creepy news and swag. I love giving away free stuff to fans, so we will always have contests and giveaways on the show. My Patreon page has even more giveaways and bonus content, including behind-the-scenes footage, opportunities for on-set experiences, when that is safe again, and exclusive episodes of Amy Keeps It Creepy. There is even a tier that gets monthly Google Hangouts with me so we can talk about all things creepy. That should be fun. If you like creepy things, please subscribe on Apple Podcast or wherever you podcast so you never miss an episode. This is a fast forward. I was so taken by the story you were about to hear that I want to make a movie about it. You can even hear me in the podcast. I'm kind of nervous and even unusually quiet because the whole time I'm listening to my guest, my little director brain is activated going over what the film would look like in my head, thinking about the shots and who I would interview. I'm obsessed. And it's because I truly believe Monte Cristo is the most haunted place in Australia, if not the world. And as soon as I wrapped the show, I talked to my producer partner and I told him, this is going to be my next project, that we have to make this film. So I am now set to produce and direct the official Monte Cristo documentary. Check out MonteCristoDocumentary.com for all the latest news about the film. I am so excited for you to listen to this episode. Oh man, do we have an exciting show for you today. When you Google most haunted places in Australia, there is one place that always makes number one, Monte Cristo Homestead. Our guest today is the son of the owners of Monte Cristo, Lawrence Ryan. He actually grew up living in the house and now runs the haunted tours there. Thank you for being with us today, Lawrence. You're welcome. So you grew up at the most haunted house in Australia? Wow. You're a brave man. What was that like? I get asked this question all the time. And really, it, it, it's, it was almost like just growing up in a normal house. We didn't know the difference uh, that our house was haunted or it was a bit strange. We just thought that was the normal thing, growing up in a house with things moving around and uh, people walking past windows when there was no one there on the property and things like that. We just thought that was normal. Now, tell me, I'm so curious, did the house have a reputation around town as being haunted back when you were young? Because that could have made finding a girlfriend more challenging, or maybe not. Maybe the chicks like the mysterious guy with the haunted house. No, I think everyone was pretty well scared of the place. It actually had the reputation of being the haunted house well before our family moved in in 1963. They actually had a poor boy chained up, a mentally retarded boy chained up for over 30 years of his life. And he used to scream out at night time and uh, it would echo into the Valley of Junee. And children would ask their parents what that terrible noise is coming from the house up on the hill. And they said, that's the monster they have at Monte Cristo. And if you don't eat your vegetables, if you don't go to bed when we see you, that's where you'll be going to live. And of course, all those urban um, myths and legends start like that. But this was actually happening in this small country town. No, that actually happened. His name was Harold Steele, right? Yeah, that's correct. Harold was uh, a son of one of the maids here at the house, and she was allowed to stay on as a caretaker after the original owners, Mr. and Mrs. Crawley, had passed away. And uh, he was chained up not to be cruel, but because of his mental disability, he used to run away, and they were scared of him dr- uh, drowning in one of the uh, the dams or the creeks here in town. So it was for his own safety. But yeah, uh, he uh, broke his arm and his leg in a carriage accident and uh, hit his head very severely. That's what uh, made him mentally disabled when he was about eight years of age. And uh, he grew up not being able to speak properly. He was hunched over because his leg and arm never set properly. And any kid that came up to take a glimpse at this so-called monster chained up at this house 
will look over the fence to see this poor boy chained to the cottage, long matted hair, claw-like fingernails, because someone was cutting his hair or his fingernails. So, uh, like I said, it had a reputation well before we even got here. That's unbelievable. Well, since we're on the topic of him, after his mother died, is it true that he cradled her dead body until people found her? Yeah, that's right. She used to go into town once a week to get supplies. And after being not seen for two weeks, someone obviously got concerned and contacted the police. They came up here to check on her and uh, they discovered she died of natural causes from a heart attack. But uh, she died in bed and her son, who was now um, uh, over 38 years of age, had been sleeping next to his dead mother for a week and a half. It's absolutely horrific, but there are so many of those stories in Monte Cristo. Now, let's start from the beginning. Your parents must be very interesting people. Monte Cristo was left vacant for over a decade before they bought it. So after they were there, it was a massive project. When was it that your parents first discovered that Monte Cristo might be different than other houses? Well, my parents bought the house in 1963, and it was left idle for a period of about 18 months after the last caretaker they had here was actually shot by a local boy after he went and saw the movie Psycho on three occasions in 1961. Oh, wow. Um, after that, they couldn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> and they couldn't get a caretaker to look after it for some reason after that. Don't know why. For some reason, Lawrence. I have no idea why. No, no, but it didn't actually kill the poor old caretaker. It certainly didn't do him any good, but the young boy left the message written on the door, die, Jack, ha, ha, after he shot the poor caretaker. So the house was left idle for this 18 months, and vandals and squatters and local kids came up and threw rocks through the windows because that's a bit fun. They kicked out all the cast iron out. They absolutely destroyed the house. The squatters that were living in the house, at, uh, sleeping in the house at night, were pulling the timber framings from the doors and windows, and even chopped out the main staircase of an axe to set fire to it to keep warm at night. But in 1963, as I mentioned, my parents bought the house as a brick shell. They bought it for a thousand pounds in 1963, which was a lot of money back then. My dad actually had to borrow from two banks uh, to get the money. They moved in the day they bought it. They moved in with no running water, no electricity, no doors or windows, nothing. They moved in with three daughters, five months pregnant with daughter number four, and they moved in in the dead of winter. What an adventure. Wow. (laughs) Oh, yes. If you talk to my mum, she said it wasn't her idea at all. Of course not. It's never the wife's idea. (laughs) (laughs) No. My my dad couldn't understand why she was so upset. (laughs) But but within weeks of purchasing the house, they uh, drove into town to get supplies. Now, Monte Cristo used to sit on the outskirts of town with no trees to throw at the front with a long dirt driveway, just as you would see in any horror movie uh, typical of the time. Now, they've gone in town to get supplies on the way back. And it's just on dusk, and as they're coming up the driveway, my dad stopped the car and hopped out. And my mum said, what are you doing? He goes, get out of the car and look up at the house. They looked up at the house, and there was lights beaming out every door and window of the homestead. And my dad described it as a horror movie, the curtains blowing through the broken windows and lights beaming out through the foggy night air. After standing there in amazement for a good five minutes, he went to hop back in the car and my mum said, what are you doing? He goes, well, we need to go up there. There's obviously squatters or something in the house. They don't realise someone's moved in. That's where we're living. That's where our stuff is. We've got to get rid of them. So they hopped in the car and as they drove up to the house, as they turned into the driveway, like someone threw a master switch, every light in every door and window turned off at once. Now, there was no electricity on the house at the time. People have claimed it might have been their car lights reflecting off the panes of glass in the doors and windows, but they'd been smashed out by the vandals. Maybe the squatters had fires lit in all the rooms or kerosene lamps, but it'd be impossible for them all on cue to blank them out at once so it looked like the house went into darkness. That's the day they knew that their house wasn't normal. To say the least, and your mom... Well, I'm sure she didn't sleep a wink that night. Wow. Fascinating. Well, uh, I, if you talk to my mum, she says she doesn't believe in ghosts and spirits because sometimes she has to be there by herself. And she puts her head in the phone. If you can't see it, if you can't hear it, if you don't acknowledge it, it doesn't exist. And that's how she's got on in all the years of being here at the house, uh, just simply just not wanting to believe. But my dad, on the other hand, he was all about the ghosts and things, of course. He thought it was interesting that there was another family living there as well as our family. So he took it in his stride and uh, eventually started doing the ghost tours at the, the house because so many people were interested in wanting to hear the stories. 
oh, the world is interested in your house for sure. Now, let's start from the beginning. There were many deaths at Monte Cristo, the first being Ethel Crowley, the baby daughter of the Crowleys, who was dropped down the stairs by a nanny. Now, the nanny claimed until her dying day that an invisible force pushed baby out of her arms. True or false? It was actually Magdalena, number 10 of the Crawley children. Now, we actually don't have any birth certificates or death certificates for the young girl. We know she existed, and she was dropped down the staircase and died as the result of a twisted bow. Now, as you mentioned, the nanny claims it was pushed from her arms by an invisible force. But we were all, we have been told by several mediums that have been to the house that she was blackmailed into dropping the child down the stairs by someone else in the family. We can't prove or say or nay if that was the case or not, but we do know she died as a result of the fall down the staircase. Wow. That's scandalous. That creepy bitch just dropped the baby. That's that's pure evil. But see, it was a different time. This is what we explain to people. Um, now, Mr. Crawley, the original owner, had 10 children to his wife, but rumoured to have another 10 to the staff at the homestead. Now, don't think it's special to this house. Yes, he was a busy man, but it was a common practice back in the day. These maids were often orphans sent out from England uh, to work for wealthy families like the Crawley family, and they aged uh, a range between 10 and 15 years. So these poor young girls were getting pregnant to the owner, and uh, they often tried to do things to make them miscarriage, a punch or a kick to the stomach, which was quite common. But there was a young maid that committed suicide off the balcony. Some say she was uh, in, in distress and threw herself off. But it was common knowledge in the town that she'd actually been pushed over the balcony or upended over the balcony to cause a miscarriage so she didn't have the child. But she hit her head on the top front step of the homestead and bled out and died as a result. When they panicked, of course, they called the police and said she's committed suicide. Was it Mr. Crowley that did it? We're not sure who actually did that. We uh, oh, we have man. the uh, it was a bit of a disagreement on the balcony, and she was shoved, and she lost her balance and went over. But once again, we weren't there on the day. We can only go from what we know from police reports and mediums that have been to the homestead. Right, but who would have had access to that balcony except the family and the maids? Interesting, very interesting. Because yes. I know Mr. Crowley was. To say the least, not the nicest guy in the world? Tell me about him. Uh, Mr. Crawley was a very astute businessman. I do believe he was, at the time, just a normal person. But anyone with power and wealth, you tend to be a little bit uh, bigger and uh, a bit more in power than than everyone else. But uh, after Mr. Crawley passed in 1910, and he died of all things from his starch collar, he actually had a blood boil on the back of his neck. He got infected from the starch collar rubbing on it, and he died of blood poisoning. So the maids killed him. The maids killed him in the end <laughs> with the starched collar. Yeah, that's a long way a long way to do it, of course. But Mrs. Crawley took charge, and that was actually very unheard of, a woman being in charge of a property like this. And it upset a lot of people because um, no woman should have this much money and power. Usually when you die, you leave everything to your boys. Um, Your wife got nothing, but uh, he did something very strange in his will and left everything to his wife. And like I said, it upset a lot of people in town because no woman should have this power. It upset the Crawley children, the boys, because they thought they were getting their inheritance. But what really upset people in town was Mrs. Crawley was actually half Aboriginal. And back then, that was very unheard of, an Englishman marrying an Aboriginal woman because you had to try and keep your bloodlines clean, of course. So that was very scandalous back in the day. Now, is it true that she never left the homestead after he died? In 22 years after her husband's death, she's only left the property on three occasions because the way people treated her in town. We've been told it was twice for a doctor's appointment and once for a funeral. So she went into long time mourning after her husband's death and became very much a recluse. But she spent more time alive on that property than any other Crawley member. And that's why we actually do believe Mrs. Crawley is our dominant spirit at the house. And if she likes you, you'll be welcomed at the homestead. But if she doesn't like you, you won't spend a moment at the homestead at all. Wow. Does she kick people out? What does she do? She's ordered people out of the house. And we actually did have a uh, ghost hunting team there a few years back from the States over. And after not getting any response after uh, 40-odd minutes in one of the back cottages where they originally uh, lived while the main house was being built, 
uh, the main uh, the lead um, investigator asked, was there anything you'd like to say or for us to do before he left? And, of course, walked out after recording, not hearing anything. But when they checked the audio the next day, he said, is there anything you'd like us to do or anything you'd like to say before we leave? And, of course, you hear Mrs. Coley say, get out. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so she can be very commanding. Wow, that's her house. Of course. And um, we've had people on our tours that um, might have had a little bit too much to drink before because they're trying to set, settle their nerves. And our house is full of beautiful antiques. And obviously, we have a strict uh, policy about people being intoxicated on the tours. And if I'm worrying about someone that I might have to say, no, you can't come on the tour, honestly, I don't have to worry. Because if you get to the front door and you're intoxicated, you'll either be violently ill, and if you do get into the first room, you'll get all faint and dizzy and feel sick and leave the tour, because Mrs. Crawley will not accept you being drunk in her house. I love it. I love it. I, I need her here when I'm having a party. Um, so tell me, Lawrence, tell me about your experiences in the house as a child. Did you Do you feel like you were protected? Do you feel like Mrs. Crawley was protecting you or any of the other spirits? I do believe um, we actually are running a bit of a parallel with the Crawley family and the Ryan family. Now, we're no relation to the original owners, but there's too many things going on. It's almost like we're just living their time again, but a, a different family. And I didn't really experience too much growing up. When I say too much, I didn't realize it was ghost or spirit. But I'm the type of person that dreams every night. It's very rare I don't dream. And as a child, we don't have dreams. We tend to have nightmares. So in other words, I had a nightmare every night growing up in that house. And when I got to about 13 years of age, I convinced my dad I didn't want to sleep in the main house anymore. And I was actually put into a private part in the back of the homestead. Still connected to the house, but it wasn't this room that I used to sleep in called the boys' bedroom. Uh, It just scared the life out of me and always felt like someone was watching me. But I did find out years later there was a good reason why I mightn't have felt very comfortable sleeping in that room by myself. My dad was telling friends that were visiting from uh, in the city some of the ghost stories. And we were not told these ghost stories as children because obviously you don't want to tell your children about the haunted house you actually live in. I think that's some sort of child abuse uh, along the line. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. But uh, Yeah, yeah. But uh, he was telling this story. And because I was 13 at the time, I was a big boy and uh, you know wasn't sleeping in the main house anymore, I thought I'd sit down and listen to some of these uh, ghostly stories that my dad used to love to tell people. And some of the stories I'd actually heard parts of before, but then he started telling a story I'd never heard before. When I was about five years of age, we had a family function at the homestead. Now, we have a big ballroom down the back, and we have parties down there and all sorts of things. And it must have been something big like a wedding or a 21st birthday party. Something was big because we had friends and relatives visiting from all over. Being five, I got tired very early. And my mum says to my elder sister, uh, take your little brother up to the house, put him to bed, and read him a come back to the party when he falls asleep. So uh, she's taken me up to the house and put me to bed, read me a story. I fell asleep very quickly. She's returned back to the party. But as being a responsible adult, my mum would send one of my other sisters up. Remember, i got four older sisters, so plenty of babysitters to check on their little brother. One by one, they come up to the house, check. I'm asleep, back to the party. But as the night's wearing on, the sister is closest to me. So she's about 13 at the time. She's asked to go check on me. She comes from the ballroom in the back of the property into the main house up the staircase to the doorway of the room looking in and stopped dead in the tracks to see me sleeping in bed with an old man standing at the edge of the bed looking down on me while I slept. Oh, my the God. Old man looked it was up. Mr. Crowley, wasn't it? I man, know it. Yes, the old man turned, looked up, and vanished into thin air. Of course, she screams and runs out of the room, leaving me unattended with who or what was in the room, oh. racing back to the ballroom, screaming out, there's a man in the house, there's a man in the house, there's a man in the house. They're the only words that they can understand coming out of a mouth. So my dad and two other male relatives race to the house thinking there's an intruder to find no one in the house and be sound asleep in bed. It takes them three hours to calm my sister down, who then gives a description of an old man in old clothes with possibly a beard standing at the edge of the bed. And yes, I do truly believe it was Mr. Crawley standing at the edge of the bed. Now, hearing that story for the first time, that tennis sent a chill down my spine. No wonder it felt like someone was always watching. Apparently there was. If I found that out all those years ago, I can assure you that would have been my last night sleeping unattended in the in that room. Oh, Lawrence, I'm getting the heebie-jeebies. And wait a minute, didn't Mr. Crawley die in that room, in the boys' room? That's correct, yes. Oh! 
Now, I've not slept back in the main house since I was a 13-year-old boy. I don't want to. I don't need to. And even when I do the tours and stand in that room, my breath is taken away from me. I've had people have asthma attacks in that room. People on day tours will complain about a rotting smell, which I do believe is the flesh rotting on Mr. Crawley's neck from the infection from the blood boil on his neck. It is a very heavy room, and we don't like to use the word evil, but that room has a bit of a funny vibe about it. And if I'm going to have someone back out of my tour, that's the room they'll usually come running out or even won't walk into. Oh, wow. That's intense. But didn't several people die in that room? Uh, we only know of Mr. Crawley that passed in that room, but we've had several mediums say that they had to clean blood off the walls, and you don't sort of explode when you die of blood poisoning, of course. So we do believe someone might have been... Uh, um, something happened to someone. That's all I can say in that room, but we do believe another two deaths have happened in that room as well. I think you were smart to move out. <laughs> For sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, did you stop having bad dreams when you moved out? Um, I still dream every night, but as an adult, you don't see them as nightmares. They're just weird dreams and things. But an interesting thing about um, our house, and I live just up the road now from the property. I actually bought land, Crawley Estate land, from my mum and dad, so I'm still on the same land. And it's all laced on a huge outlay of quartz crystal. Now, if you talk to anyone that knows anything about crystals, they will let you know the quartz crystal is a magnification to the spirit world. And if you sit with a medium or anyone that connects to the spirit world, you'll notice they'll always have a piece of quartz with them. It helps energize or magnify it. So imagine a whole property, a whole house built on a huge outlay of quartz crystal and it being mag- magnified tenfold. This is why we have the reputation of being Australia's most haunted house. It's not because we have more spirits than some other places, jails or hospitals or, or asylums. We just have more activity, and that has a lot to do with it. You're in a paranormal magnification zone of crystals. That is That blows my mind. Amy Keeps It Creepy is sponsored in part by A Candle Story. A Candle Story makes luxury hand-poured artisan candles that smell absolutely amazing. Currently, they have several collections like Fairy Tale, Trailer Park Chic, and my personal favorite, the Creepy Candle Collection, where you can find candles like Psychopath, Shallow Grave, and The Husband Did It. Because it's always the husband. And don't you want to smell what a failed lie detector test really smells like? I think I'm going to burn that one tonight. Go to acandlestory.com to pick up your creepy candle today. Tell me about the land. Do you have experiences on the Crowley land that it's also haunted? Oh, yes. I can assure you my house is just as haunted as what that is down there. I'd like to think it's not. But um, I actually had an incident last night, funny enough. Um, Oh, tell me. Tell me. What happened? My partner and I are lying in bed and we got a bit of uh, incense burning trying to clear a bit of energy in the room because um, my house is actually an old house that was brought to the property so it already has an energy, a residual energy about it. And when you bring something that already has an energy and put it on somewhere with this quartz crystal, you're magnifying it. So not only spirits that reside on the land, even like jewellery or furniture or a house you can bring to be amplified. And I do believe I have a spirit that came with the house um, he's been seen in the hallways, walking down the hallways and movement. And Sometimes you lie in bed and you just feel agitated, like you can't go to sleep. And we were both lying there sort of saying this, you know, that we can't get to sleep, we're dead tired, we've been working all day. And we're just about to go to sleep or nod off it finally when we heard a voice in the room say something. And she quickly said to me, what did you say? I said, what did you say? She goes, that wasn't you? I said, no, I was about to say, what did you say? but clearly heard a voice. I can't pick what the word was, but someone spoke in the room. So I can assure you there's a lot going on in this la- on this land here as well. Oh, Lawrence, that's a good woman you've got there. That's a patient, good woman, because I would have been out of there, oh, so fast. I oh, know, she's, brave. she's braver than me. She actually came to me about a year ago and said, oh, we should try sleeping in Monte Cristo in the main house, um, in the boys' bedroom. And she does the tours with me and helps and uh, brings the guests through. And I sort of gave her a bit of a blank look and said, do you listen to what I say on the tours and explain how to people that this room still scares me and I haven't slept in this room since I was a 30-year-old boy? Why would you even ask would I want to sleep back in the house? And she said, it'd be fun. 
And I said, well, your idea of fun and my idea of fun are obviously two different things because I don't want to sleep here. <laughs> and um, after, after refusing, she actually spent the night down there with one of her uh, older uh, daughters, who's about 21 at the time, um, and they slept the night and they said the amount of footsteps up and down the hallway, you could hear cupboards being shut in the other rooms and drawers and footsteps on timber floor, yet the house is carpeted as well. And um, my partner and her daughter are both connected to the spirit world and they actually saw uh, um, figures in the hallway walking past as well. And the next morning I said, you know, they were telling me all this. And I went, oh, that sounds wonderful. Have you got your fix uh, of, you know, what you say? She goes, I can't believe it was wonderful. I said, well, once again, what you think is wonderful and what I think is wonderful are two different things altogether because I'm <laughs> quite happy not to spend the night down there. Oh, man. That's great. That's great. So how many resident ghosts are there? I've heard rumors of about 10 ghosts you have that you've identified. Yeah, we know of 10 people have passed on the property. Now, that's not unusual. People died at home back in the day. Um but some of the deaths, like I said, the maid falling off the balcony and hitting the head and dying, um, not sort of natural. Um, Magdalena dropped down the staircase. Mr. and Mrs. Crawley both died on the property. Mr. Crawley in the boys' room. Mrs. Crawley in the downstairs breakfast room. Um, but we know of other spirits that come and go to the house, something that they've had maybe business dealings or something that happened at the time, and their presence will show up every so often as well. But um, we know there's probably about four or five children maybe buried on the property that were born, still born, or uh, died during childbirth. Because if the maids didn't miscarry by punching or kicking them in the stomach, they were brought into the main house, into the girls' room, opposite to the boys' room, to deliver then. And they didn't invite the doctor up because the doctor would go into town and gossip about what's going on at the homestead. So one of the other young maids, remember, the oldest one would have been 15 if they were lucky, was chosen to do the birthing or, or or try and bring this child into the world. And we know there's a lot of children's spirit here at the house as well. And it is quite obvious we hear children playing ring a ring a rosy or hide and go seek at night time. You'll hear children giggling in the hallway. Um, we've had people have their hair pulled as a nasty sister might do to another sister just out of, out of spite. But my partner also has a lovely doll museum, which we put on the property as well. And she has a lovely collection of porcelain dolls, but she also has a bit of a sick sense of humor and has, you know, square wolf dolls and Annabelle dolls and Chucky dolls and things. And it's actually built over the top of where I do believe the children might have been buried. And many times we've gone down there after locking the museum up and coming the next morning and the creepy dolls have been knocked off the shelves. The porcelain dolls have been left alone. It's almost like they're too scary for these little children. They don't like them, so they push them out of the way. So, yeah, a lot going on at the house. There are stories about animals having issues on the property, especially pets. Yes, uh, pets and animals don't do particularly well. Now, we've never owned any animals. The, the cats and things that we have are always stray cats that tend to come to the property because we used to be all farmland behind us. We've now been built in a little bit with modern building and, and um, suburbia coming in around the house. But the very first animal that was brought to the homestead was my mum and dad's cat. Now, they went and retrieved it from relatives about a month after being at the homestead. Now, when they pulled up the front of the house, my mum took the cat out of the car and sat it on the front step of the house. And you know when cats are a little bit cautious, you know, new area, they're sort of feeling it out a bit. The cat walked up to the doorway, or what was left of the doorway, when all the fur stood up on its back and it hissed. It then bolted up the remains of the staircase, getting to the top balcony, cannot escape. It leaps from the top balcony, landing on its feet, running into town, never to be seen again. That was the end of the family cat. Oh. Now... That, that was uh, gone. My dad was pretty happy because we didn't have to feed that animal. And mum and dad were doing things pretty tough at the time, so that was extra food that they didn't have to uh, worry about. But remember, like I said, on the outskirts of town with farmland behind us, we used to get cats coming up, and my dad was a bit of a softie and used to feed them what scrap food they had. And, of course, they'd get pregnant and they'd have a litter of kittens. But within weeks of the kittens being born, they'd all froth at the mouth one by one and die. Now, at first, my father thought this might have been rabbit poisoning, which was popular back at the time, that they might have been eating and being sick and even the mother eating it and poisoning the milk. But after several litters of kittens, one batch of kittens, one of the cats survived and grew up to be the family cat. Now, the years had gone by, this cat wasn't coming into the house. 
It would come near the house but would not come into the house, as all animals won't. But this morning, my mum came down to make breakfast for the family. She walked into the room to find the cat dead on the floor. Now, it wasn't just dead. It had been disemboweled and its eyes gouged out of its head sitting away from its body. What? Now, you That's can horror show. My mum. Yeah. Which spirit and did you that? You can imagine the fright that my mum. We're not sure. We do believe it's one of the Crawley boys who had a bit of a, a nasty uh, streak about him and we've been told he used to like to skin cats and rabbits and pin them up on boards and things and yeah, not particularly nice and he he passed of course so I think he might have come back to the house maybe to give my mum a bit of a scare. Now my dad obviously tried to explain to my mum that maybe a dog or a fox had dragged this cat in but the way it was displayed it was like someone was trying to scare my mum in particular away from the house. Sounds so, like So uh, yeah, unfortunately... Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, animals don't just don't really like the house at all. But uh, they say children and animals are very uh, yeah, queer to the spirit world, so they tend to see and uh, sense things more than us adults do. Do you think there's a sinister force at Monte Cristo? I do believe there is. There's two spirits that can be quite nasty. Now, I get lots of people asking about demons and monsters and things like that, and I'm not a big believer in that sort of thing. I tell people, if you weren't a nice person when you're alive, chances are you're not a nice one when you're dead. And I've met some horrible people in my time I wouldn't want to meet when they were dead. And I can assure you there's a couple of people on this property that uh, used to reside here that were not nice people at all. Um, My dad, uh, he bought the house, Monte Cristo, from the last remaining Crawley child alive, which was number nine of the Crawley children, Alphonse Crawley. And my dad, and this always sticks in my head as a memory I had as a child, of him telling the story that he's met thousands of people in his lifetime, but he's never met someone more mean-natured than Alphonse Crawley. He just said he was a mean, mean, bitter man. So I do believe his spirit is one of our stronger, sort of nastier ones at the house. Oh, yeah. That guy is totally the one killing the cats. Now, has anyone ever tried to talk to him or get in contact with him? Uh, yes, uh, we like I said, we get plenty of mediums come through, of course, but uh, he's uh, he keeps to himself, and Mrs. Corley is the dominant spirit. She keeps everyone in line. Um, in the boys' bedroom, when I do the ghost tours, because that's the only time I'm really in that room anymore now, um, he stands behind me, Alphonse, and leans over me as if he's trying to intimidate me or bully me. And um, I didn't realize it at first. Oh, can you feel him? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's like someone standing over the top of you trying to make you feel smaller and oh. worse, I suppose would be the right word. Um, but I soon learned, a friend of mine, a medium friend, told me that I need to put my shoulders back and, and present myself as a strong figure as well and not to be intimidated. So I started doing that and the, it sort of went away a little bit. But there's a certain part of the room I don't stand in because if I stand in that certain spot, he puts his thumb in the back of my shoulder blade and pinches around the top of my shoulder and squeezes in on a, a nerve that I damaged from a motorcycle accident about three years ago. And it really, really hurts. So I don't tend to stand there. But funny enough, when I tell the story on the tour, the person standing in that exact spot goes, oh my goodness, before you start telling that story, I could feel something grabbing in my shoulder or pinching a nerve in my shoulder. But yeah, they think you're, you're me. <laughs> so he's having a little bit of fun. <gasps> no way. Wow. Are there any other places that you avoid? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, the boys' room is probably one of the main ones. And it's because I grew up there in, in that room too, that uh, just doesn't make me feel comfortable. And um, I've been told by several mediums that Mr. Crawley will actually stand behind me in that room because he feels safe when I'm in the room because he knows that I don't take any any rubbish or any problems from Alphonse. And he's actually scared of his own son, we've been told. So uh, you can imagine what sort of overwhelming person uh, this Alphonse was. If you like creepy things, subscribe to Amy Keeps It Creepy on Apple Podcasts or wherever you podcast so you can obsess with me every week about true crime and the paranormal. If you subscribe and leave us a review, make sure to screenshot your review and email it to me at info at creepypodcast.com for your chance to win a weekly candle giveaway from our sponsor, acandlestory.com. Acandlestory.com makes amazing luxury candles with unique scents like Trailer Park Princess, Haunted Plantation, and Patient Zero. Burn one today and keep it creepy.
we don't drum, <laughs> tell too many people this because when you do our tour and stay overnight, one of the rooms actually has one of the original beds from the house. And uh, it was actually the original bed from the girls' room. And we know from records that a maiden child died during childbirth in that bed. Now, when the guests are told the next morning about that, after they have just told us a story about being held or pinned to their bed by their ankles and reached and someone's wiping sweat from their forehead, or they can't sleep because of the intense back pain or stomach aches while lying in that bed, and then, of course, told that that's the bed that um, uh, the maid died in, of course, it makes complete sense. But funny enough, my dad was given that bed by people had bought it, or had got it from the homestead before my mum and dad had bought the house, and they donated it back to my dad and said it was from the girl's room and the maid died during childbirth in that bed. But I never asked my dad why. He never put it back into the girl's room. It actually went into the boy's bedroom and that's the bed that I grew up as a small child up until I was 13 sleeping in every night having nightmares was that bed. Oh, that is so creepy. Oh. I said one of the dreams that I used to have, uh, because I have lots of repetitive dreams and nightmares because, and one that sort of stuck with me was taking bodies away from the house at night and burying them in the backyard of the homestead. Now, as a small child, I didn't understand what this was. It's just like a horrible dream or something I must have saw on TV or the news or something. But as I got older, I, I realized that getting rid of the bodies was getting easier because as I was getting bigger, I was being able to use a wheelbarrow to put the body in, take it down the back and bury it. And uh, But waking up the next morning thinking, what is wrong with me? Why would I dream that? But I always remember waking up being feeling very remorseful, as in I shouldn't have done it. But the scariest thing actually happened after I left my home, and when I built my house, I was doing big foundations for the uh, for the veranda of the homestead. And my son, who was about eight at the time, um, I woke up the next morning almost crying in sweats and feeling nauseously sick because I dreamt that night that I buried him in the, the pier of the building and poured concrete or cement on him uh, to get rid of his body. And just feeling sick and remorseful that, you know, how could I do that to my own child? But I think it has a lot to do with the spirit of the house. And maybe that I'm feeling what the person was that took the bodies from the stillborn back and burying them. And then maybe even burying one of his own child, children, because the staff, you know, the work hands played around with the maids as well, of course. And they were probably actually in love. So to bury your own child, the spirits want you to know what it must have felt like. And that's one thing with our spirits at Monte Cristo. They're very clever on how they in tune with people coming to visit. And it's not to be nasty. It's not to be cruel. It's not to scare you. But it's to give you the sense and the feeling of what they went through. So uh, it can be quite scaring and horrifying at sometimes. To feel what they felt, the anguish, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's even, I think that's more intense than just seeing a spirit in front of me. To actually have those feelings. I mean, that's raw. Oh. So do you know, is there a cemetery on the grounds or do you know where bodies were buried? Um, there's no cemetery or graves on the property. There is bodies buried on the property and I can pretty much tell you where I reckon it was in my dreams. I know exactly where I was taking the bodies and burying them. And like I said, it's where the doll museum is sort of built over at the, at the moment uh, on the property. Where the children are. Where the children are. They're with the dolls. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> So I find I find that quite interesting. And we have some dolls in the girls' room of the house too, and we know of a maid that comes in and out of the room. She likes to look at the dolls because these were things that were not given as children because these maids were orphans brought out from England uh, between, you know, 10 and uh, 15 years of age, robbed of their childhood, never ever was given a doll or had a doll to play with. So they're quite intrigued with the dolls that we do have on the property uh, in the museum and in the main house as well. And uh, you hear of ghost hunters using trigger objects where they take something into a haunted location to get a response. Um, we already have all these things here that they interact with. Um, so uh, it is very interesting. Wow. So has anyone had any interactions with the maids who are, are still living there, the, the spirit maids? Oh, yes, I have one called Molly that will often try and pull me out of the boys' bedroom. I stand near the doorway and my arm will start to lean out like someone's trying to pull me out of the room. And I would describe it as a smaller child. When I say smaller, probably about 12 or so. Uh, she doesn't like me being in the room because she's scared of the energy in that room as well. But she's also in another room where Mrs. Crawley used to spend a lot of time in. And apparently she likes me in the room uh, because she doesn't get yelled at when I'm in the room by Mrs. Crawley because sometimes she's a bit slow and doesn't do a job quick enough. 
Um, so she likes it when I'm in the room. I've been told by several mediums that she thinks that I'm it in a bit, uh, she says, uh, which is a very old saying when someone's a bit taken by you. But, uh, yeah, it, it, um, her, her presence is quite strong. Like I said, people sleeping in that bed with the maids and the traumatic through that, traumatising through that. But the Crawley girls are very prominent in the house. And for my guests staying, we advise them to put uh, watches or car keys or jewellery in their bags. Don't leave them on the side table or the dresser because nine times out of ten, the next morning they'll be gone. They'll be taken. Now, they will put them back, but usually once it's left, and that's a huge problem if it was your car keys because I don't know how you're left without them. But uh, we have so many stories of people not being able to find things and then they've rung up and said, can we double-check the room? And we'll tell them, yeah, it was where you left it on the side table. They went, no. We swear that we checked that room, we turned that room upside down, we couldn't find the watch or the glasses. Uh, but they'll be sitting there, bold as punch, uh, next to the bed when we go to clean the rooms. I'm fascinated by the brave guests that stay at your homestead. Tell me the crazy stories they've had that they've told you about. Oh, there's, there's so many. I do not have a week go by that someone doesn't have a reaction to staying the night here. and That's what makes it interesting, spending the night. But some people sit in their room, sitting bolt right up in bed, lights left on, humming and whistling or listening to their radio on their phone uh, because they're not game to lie down and go to, go to sleep. One of the probably more frightening things that happened to one of our guests was a um, brother and sister had turned up to do the tour. Now, uh, we did the tour. We don't finish till about 11 o'clock at night. By the time everyone winds down, it is getting close to midnight and everyone's usually pretty worn out from the tour. She's gone to bed in one of the rooms and uh, it has a single bed and a double bed. Her brother is in the double bed. She's lying in the single bed and she noticed her brother's fallen asleep very quickly. He's actually snoring a little bit. As she's lying in the bed, she feels pressure pushing down on her and she, she describes it as someone lying on top of her. Now, of course, she thinks, oh, Mr. Crawley or one of the Crawley boys come to help themselves. No, thank you. The people next door look super interesting. Go talk to them. I'm good, thank you. With that, the weight starts pushing down on her and she gets a bit scared. So she goes to say something to her brother to get up and turn on the light. There's something wrong. When she realizes she's now paralyzed, she can't move, she can't speak, she can't do anything. Uh. So at this point, she's starting to panic. A, at this point, she's starting to panic a bit and she's describing the weight as a dead weight, like someone's falling asleep against you or on top of you. With that, she starts saying, get off me, get off me, get off me now. Then she hears a male's voice in her ear go, <laughs> now at that point you can imagine you'd be freaking out just a little bit now oh, she's wow. telling the story the next morning over breakfast to the other guests who are all now sitting at the edge of the seat going oh my god what did you do next she goes you're all going to think I'm a bit weird but this is the first thing that came into my mind I pictured whoever was lying on top of me Mr. Crawley or one of the Crawley boys I pictured them in women's clothing with that she hears a huh and the weight lift off her and she screams out and regains control of her body and the brother jumps up and turns on the light because no one is in the room with her. She then sits bolt right up in the bed and will not go back to sleep for the rest of the night because she's scared that they might come back. You know, people ask me, dressed in women's clothing, what do you mean? The biggest insult to a man of the Victorian era was to say he was a woman. Mm-hmm. Men were men. They had mm-hmm. short hair. They grew a beard as soon as they could grow it. The biggest insult was to say they were a woman. So she virtually insulted whoever was lying on top of them to get off. She said she'd never Smart. come back to the house again. Oh. But you have fun there at Monte Cristo. I've seen pictures of the amazing balls you throw at the homestead where everyone dresses in period dress. It looks like so much fun. Now, after you have one of those parties, I'm so curious about the activity in the house. Oh, yes. Um that was the type, the, the Victorian ball that we run each year, and we now have turned into a bit more of a haunted ball to bring younger people to the house, of course. Um, but they had a ballroom originally on the property. It was torn down. My dad actually rebuilt the ballroom, and actually not knowing, built it on the same spot, the same dimensions, and was told by one of the maids that used to work at the house in the early 70s that he built it on the same spot, the same dimensions, yet he didn't even know. It doesn't surprise me because I feel like your dad was connected to this land. I really do. Oh, yes. Um, he, he believes he was brought to that house to look after it. And when you see all the work that's been done and things, no sane person would have thought that was a good idea. But when we do have the ball, um, people take photographs because obviously everyone's dressed up to the nines and everyone's having a great time. 
If you have a look in the mirrors, in the back windows of the house, you'll often see faces peering in. It's the resident spirits having a great time thing, and that's the most wonderful thing we've ever seen, to see all these people in period costumes dancing the night away, just as it was back in the Victorian era. And for guests staying the night, when we don't have our ball, people ask us about the party we had last night and why they weren't invited. And when we say, what do you mean? They said, we could hear. sound like 150 people chatting down in the ballroom. We could even hear music coming from the ballroom at night. But unbeknown to them, there was no one down there. And I surely tell you, I wasn't having any parties that night. Oh, but the spirits are there. They're having parties at your homestead. They are living their lives, continuing living their lives. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Lawrence, thank you so much. And I will tell you right now, if you ever change your mind about staying in the main house, I would love to film that, my dear. <laughs> That's a whole documentary. <laughs> but there's a million other stories I can tell you. You can call one or two things coincidence, but after that, you can't call it coincidence at all. Absolutely not. No, I have no doubt that Monte Cristo Homestead is the most haunted place in Australia. Creepy. So creepy. Oh, I can't wait for COVID to be over. I mean, for lots of reasons, but also so I can jump on a plane and start filming this movie. Come on, it's going to be an amazing documentary. Can you imagine if I am able to truly document the paranormal activity there? I mean, I might have to have tea with Mrs. Crowley and ask her permission to film on her homestead and tell her story. Hopefully she'll like me and not mess with my film equipment too much. Make sure to check out MontecristoDocumentary.com for all the latest news and social media links. I'm dying to hear what you think about Monte Cristo. If you share my obsession with creepy things, please subscribe and leave us a review. If you screenshot your review and email it to info at creepypodcast.com, you will be entered to win my favorite creepy candle of the week from acandlestory.com. Winners from all of our giveaways are contacted directly and announced on our Instagram page at creepypodcast. Please check out our website, creepypodcast.com, for all the terms and conditions. Thank you for listening. Toxic content.